All right, everybody, welcome back to the number one television program in the history of the entire universe. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown. All three books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Now today, everybody, we're going to be doing another um, in-depth Stephen King book discussion and this time the book that we will be discussing is The Shining. Now this book came out in 1977. It was his third book he ever published after Carrie and Salem's Lot came The Shining. It's been around a long time. It's built up a big following. Most Stephen King fans would probably consider this book one of their top 10 or top 5 Stephen King books of all time. Now I've also got this hardcover version, which is okay. It goes in my hardcover shelf and everything. But I think I like the design of this one better. Um, so um, if you've watched my channel for any length of time, you know that I have read and reviewed all the Stephen King books prior to this. But those were spoiler-free book reviews. Now we're going to be doing spoiler-filled book discussions. So... Just keep in mind, we're going to be talking spoilers through this. Also, if you watched my spoiler-free review of this book, you know it wasn't really one of my favorite Stephen King novels, which is blasphemous to Stephen King fans. How can The Shining not be in your top 10? Well, I did a ranking, like the top 90 Stephen King books ranked, and this was like, this was like in the 70s. It wasn't even one of my top 50. So this is a little bit of a controversial book for me personally. Um, and it all started when I saw the Jack Nicholson, Stanley Kubrick version of The Shining first, and I just loved that movie, everything about it. And it's kind of unfairly biased me against the book. You know, a lot of times people are like, the book is better than the movie. This is one instance where I was like, I really kind of like the movie better than the book. And after rereading it four or five times, I've never changed my mind. I wanted to reread it one more time here, and I wanted to see if I could read it slower, really concentrate on it, and see if I couldn't gain a new appreciation for the book that I haven't previously had. And that took a turn for the bizarre, folks, I'm telling you. It took a turn for the bizarre, but in a way what happened was wildly appropriate too. Because I don't know if you watched my two or three days ago, I did a, a review of whiskey like I did a I don't drink I'm not a drinker I've never been drunk in my life except for recently I got pretty hammered and I ended up reading this book when I was pretty and hammered um but I did a book uh, I did a whiskey review where I, I taste tested a bunch of whiskeys and I got sloshed I was breathing fire I was pooping molten lava oh my god I couldn't even urinate that was just the poor little thing just was coughing up ashes because I was so drunk on this whiskey that was just so potent. It ruined me. But I read this book whilst I was ruined. Honestly, it helped me like the book a lot more. So I'm going to put up this bottle of Ardveg 10 Smoky Scotch Whiskey. And we're going to set this next to the book to remind us of some of the themes of the book because what's crazy is alcoholism and child abuse and bad parenting are the themes that are running through this book just almost bludgeoning you over the head with the theme of the alcoholism and the bad parenting. So let's get into it. Let's talk about um, my new rediscovery of The Shining and my new slightly better appreciation for the book because... I read it whilst up. I don't know what that says about me or the book, but it's saying something. Now, let's start with um, Jack Torrance, who we get to. The, the book starts with Jack Torrance. He's a, he's a new father. He's married. He's at a job interview. And there's a guy named Ullman who is interviewing him for this job. And um, one of the great, by the way, this book does have one of the greatest opening lines of a Stephen King novel, where he's just like, the guy was an officious little prick. I think I can read it here. Um, it's just one of my favorite lines, and it starts the book off wildly, you know, just super. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
Jack Torrance thought, a vicious little prick. And he's thinking, a vicious little prick, about Ullman, who is the guy that's interviewing him for the job. Now, um, Ullman uh, describes the job in the first chapter. And this is where we get a pretty good description of what might be coming down the road. So there's a hotel up in Colorado Rockies that needs someone to stay there throughout the winter and keep things running. Make sure things don't freeze, the pipes don't freeze, everything is kind of, because the, I live in Salt Lake City and you know, you get up in the mountains in the winter and it can be like devastatingly cold and you need, and, and if you've got a big hotel up there, uh, you know, you need people in there year round to keep it going. Otherwise it's just gonna freeze up and, and nothing will work when you try to run it in the summer. That's the job he's applying for. Now he described, now Ullman describes the previous employee that tried to do this. That, so you got to go up there and live alone in this hotel for the entire length of the winter. You're cut off from society. You have to eat what food you brought um, or what's available. And But you, you do have a nice hotel to live in, but you gotta keep it warm. You gotta keep it so it doesn't freeze. And, and Ullman describes the job in great detail and it describes what happened to the previous person that did the job. And that guy went crazy. He had two little girls um, and he went crazy. Um, he was a, it was, there was a tragedy. Um, things didn't work out. This is a hard job. You just don't want to take your family up into this place for six months and be alone. And he's like, but he's being kind of a dick about, like, I don't, he's like, I'm looking at you, Jack, and I don't know if you're the guy for the job. You seem to be kind of like the previous guy. And the previous guy was an alcoholic. And you kind of give me the vibe that you might be too. And Torrance, um, well, yeah, he's, Ullman is sussing the situation out pretty correctly. He, uh, Torrance, Jack Torrance himself is an alcoholic, and he's got problems with anger issues. Um, and, um, you know, he's just, turns out, not a nice guy, really. And uh, he's got a history of the alcohol abuse. Um, he ain't a good guy. He, um, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of things that would give anyone hesitation of sending Jack up there. And, but they, he takes the job. Well, nobody wants the job. He gets the job sort of by default. Nobody else applies. So Jack Torrance takes his wife and Wendy and his son, Danny, up to uh, the uh, hotel. And there they, um, you know, the hotel when they arrive there is full of people. Uh, the other employees are there, of course. Um, there's a guy named Watson who shows Jack how to run everything in the hotel. He shows them how to run the boiler, how to run all of the stuff, how to trim the hedges, how to keep things going, how to, you just everything that needs to be done about the hotel. Now, this is great because this really sets things up. Ullman's original description of the hotel and the job itself really sets up the story well. And then as Watson is walking Jack around the hotel once they get there, that also sets up the scene really well. It's a great way to do it. Stephen King was brilliant for using that so those two characters as our setup guys for what might go down later so wendy and um danny are wendy is his wife and danny is his young son and danny um has already both wendy and danny have already seen the dark side of jack torrance um you know, we get scenes where we see kind of the abuse he's put them through. He's he's not a good guy, but he's trying to be a good guy. Um, he wants, Jack Torrance just literally wants to take this job to use the time alone um, in the hotel to write, to, to, you know, to get his writing career on track. Um, and one of the scenes that I really enjoyed was their drive up to the hotel, because they've never been in the Rockies before. They're just all over, they're just in awe of the mountains. And they're in a little VW bug, um, and they're driving up and, they, and they're driving through the mountains. It's just a beautiful little set piece where they're kind of, it's like they're going to this castle in the hill, this like beautiful thing that they've never seen before. And my gosh, all the excitement they feel, but yet some of the trepidation they feel because they don't know what's coming. They don't know what this job is gonna be like. They don't know what their life is gonna be like. For them. It's like it's, they're really going on an adventure here. And, and Stephen King gives a good sense of that as they're driving up to the hotel. And once they get to the hotel, um, you know, even before that, 
our young boy Danny, who is really the main character of this story. He um, has this uh, supernatural ability that he just doesn't really talk about called The Shining, which is what the book is titled, um, where he just sees things in the future, the like, hints of things. He's a little bit clairvoyant. Um, he's already He's already seen the dark side of his father, which has brought out the dark side of his sort of prophetic nature and where he can see like in red letters um he fears the divorce of his parents more than anything and in red letters he just sees this term red rum everywhere in his dreams he just sees red rum red rum red rum and and then once they get to the hotel this shining the part of the boy that is called the shining really starts to cook up a little bit um so anyway um young danny um meets his own friend at the um hotel and that is Haller Hallerum. Um God, what was that guy's name? Hallerman? Hallerum? Can't remember Hallerman or Hallerum. But he's the cook of the uh, at the hotel and he he ta he kind of takes Danny under wing because Hallerum also has the shining. He also can see things that are going to come up in the future. Um he also can see those images and and um uh, see the past. See, he sees things from the past. Both him and Danny see things from the past and the future. Um, they call it the shine. Um, uh, he kind of takes Danny under wing and warns him about different parts of the hotel itself because the hotel really sort of to Danny looks like this creepy kind of ghost haunted building anyway and um Halloran uh, is telling him don't go into room 217 and Halloran uh, Halloran I can't remember it's Halloran or Halloran I just sorry but um anyway we'll just call him Halloran from now on he he's telling uh, uh you know um Danny you know there's some things you need to watch out for in this hotel you need to keep your eye on your dad um this hotel has got a lot of secrets he tells you know between what Watson tells Jack Torrance about the hotel and what Hallerum is telling young Danny about the hotel, the hotel really starts to develop as the monstrous creature in the story that they're going to have to fight, which is yes and no. The monstrous creature in the story is really the alcoholism of Jack Torrance and his abuse um, of his family once the alcohol takes hold. Um, and I think that the hotel itself is sort of an allegory of the whole parenting. And Stephen King does this really well, is he shows young children so well that deal with parents that are not good parents. And, you know, par bad parenting is the number one disease in the world. You know, and I think Stephen King knows this. I mean, bad parenting leads to children that grow up to be bad parents who lead to children that grow up to, you know what I mean? It's just a never ending cycle. And it causes disease states in people wherein they become alcoholics. Like, I mean, I've only been drunk the one time as I was reading this. And um, I'm telling you, I was like, okay, I was like out of it, read, reading a book of a people that are out of it. And it was, it was like a crazy, crazy thing. And I can see how this kind of a thing can become an addiction to people and how things can just go bad. And um, that is, and that's because bad parenting, bad parenting leads people to different coping mechanisms. I mean, Jack Torrance's coping mechanism for his bad parents, everybody in this story, Wendy, Jack, Danny, every person that comes up has a story about bad parents. They were all raised by shitheads. And Jack's coping mechanism was alcoholism, which leads to diseases, which leads to a shorter lifespan. You know, um, now Danny, the young Danny's coping mechanism is the shining, is the shining, is, is leaning into the shine. And, um, you know, it's, which is eventually going to be a, a disease state that leads to a shorter lifespan for him too. And um, as you can see, just bad parenting, people cope because they were raised by assholes and, and they're coping, whether it's eating too much or smoking or drinking or 
depression or anxiety. It just it kills you. It just kills you. That's the, that's the whole point of this whole story. The monster is the hotel, but the monster is also bad parenting. And the other monster is alcohol. Um, and that's what we're fighting here. The, there's, a, there's a lot of different monsters that are crawling through this story. And Stephen King really interweaves it fantastically. Um, so everybody leaves the hotel except for the three main characters. So all the people that work in the hotel slowly leave as winter starts to come. And, and then it's just down to Danny, the young boy, his mom, Wendy, and the father, Jack. And at first it's a pretty idyllic, um, situation. They're kind of all liking it. Hey, you know, um, you're almost happy for the family in their new place. But then we get these scenes where... We see young Danny just kind of pleading with his father not to hurt his mom, not to hurt other people in, you know, the future. Um, things are really kind of starting to slowly spiral into delusion. People are starting to see ghosts in the, like, the characters are starting to see ghosts in the, in the hallways. Very, and it, and it kind of goes very quick, about halfway through um, the point in the book, um, things just kind of go ass over teapot with the... I mean, Danny's seeing ghosts. Um, the father is hearing things and he's drinking too much. The Wendy, the wife, is becoming extra paranoid about all of it. And it's just a toxic situation for everybody. And the hotel itself sort of looms as a big monster over the top of all of them, where even the sculpted hedges outside seem to be coming to life. Um, Danny is communicating. Danny is seeing, he, he, you know, he... Halloran told him to stay out of room 217, but I mean, my God, I mean, if someone told me to stay out of room 217, I don't care what age I am, I'm going to go right directly into room 217. And so, you know, we get to find out what creepy stuff is in room 217. There's an old, there's just an old naked woman that's just very freaky and frightening and ghoulish, and it's just cool. And then we get the, um, the hints of the previous guy that took care of the place and his young daughters and then we get Danny Oz communicating with Hallorum. So Hallorum, the one the old man that had the shine that sort of told Danny to stay out of room 217 and sort of told Danny about all the ghosts and things that he needs to watch out for in this hotel. He's moved on to Florida for the summer. Well, Danny can still communicate to Hallorum and through the shine and um it, a lot of the things that Danny is telling him through this long distance communique they can do through their brains, um, Hallerman starts to get worried about the family. So we get in the second half of the book, we get this whole scenario where Hallerman is racing back to Colorado to help the family out. And so we get, and this is where the movie and well, the movie is not like the, this a book at all. I mean, this is one of those Stephen King novels where, the movie with the Jack Nicholson thing is such a piece of art on its own. It's just loosely based off of this. Now, um, uh, the scenes with Hallerman getting on the plane and, 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 and all the delays that he's got with the plane and the aircraft and all the things that go wrong and just, it's, and, and you're like, okay, is he really going to make it to Colorado on time? Is he going to get, how's he going to get up into the mountains? Is, He's plotting to use a snowmobile and all these different things. And so a half of the time you're spent with Hallerman on this plane trip and the, the driving into the mountains and trying to get back to the hotel in time to save everybody. And that part of the story is where I just don't give up. I guess that's where um, I'm just like, I'd rather just be with Danny and his father and his mother as they deal with the horrors of the hotel and, and, and the horrors of the alcoholism and the horrors that Danny's going through with his father's demons and all that. Um, and then, but then we keep skipping back to the Hallerman racing in and, um, it, but it is kind of, I, and I understand why Stephen King's doing this because he's, he's building up this hotel as this monstrous thing. That's full of all these horrors. It's like a real haunted house type story. The hotel itself becomes a real haunted house and Jack, the father, is an alcoholic who really is not, he's just contributing to the problems of the ghosts that Danny sees and, and then the, the, the tortures that he's putting his, his wife through. And it all sort of kind of this race for Hallerman to save the family, the family slowly spiraling into what's going to be a fiery end. 
and how is it all going to pull together in the end? This is the book. This is the book. This is not really the movie at all. Um, the And all of it comes to the end. There's a, of course, we end in the boiler room. You know, Hallerman does make it, of course. Um, there's a big explosion. The, the, everything boils to a head, literally, in the boiler room. Now, the boiler room, oh, my God. Okay, so here's the thing is I work, if you followed my channel, you know I work at the Utah State Prison. And the old prison, we just moved to a new prison. I mean, the state spent $2 billion to build a new prison for 6,000 inmates. We used to have the old prison. Now, the old prison was built in the 1950s. And they had a boiler room that was buried six stories underground. And I asked the boiler guys, like, why is it so deep underground? That, why? And they're like, well, because if it explodes, it'll wipe out half of Salt Lake City. And I was like, what are you talking about? So then I googled boiler room explosions, and apparently there is, there, they ain't no fucking joke. They ain't no fucking joke. They said that uh, they buried that, that boiler that kept the, uh, Utah, the old Utah State Prison, because it's a big prison, 6,000 inmates, you know. They buried it six stories underground in case it did explode. Well, it would just explode straight up, and it wouldn't cause that much damage to the surrounding community. And then I noticed, and I, I think, and I swear to God, maybe maybe I read this as I was drunk also, because I was Googling boiler room explosions as I was up on this stuff. And um, I read a story where a boiler room, a boiler exploded that was buried six stories underground, and it um, exploded straight up in the air, and it blew the top off of the building, and they found the boiler, the actual boiler, like some 27 miles away. I don't know how the... I mean, those boilers are huge. I've, I went down and saw the boiler in the Utah State Prison. I went down. It is It was buried, and there was catwalks. There was like 10,000 pipes and dials and different things on it. And I was like, who keeps track of all this? And they're like, yeah, if, if any one of these pipes and dials, and there's tens of thousands of them, is even slightly off, the thing can explode. And I'm like, well, who's who's monitoring all these? And they're, and they're like, well, the inmates do. And I'm like, oh, Lord have mercy on all of us. But anyway, okay. So um, the boiler explosion, uh, you know, that's how the book ends. And the, the whole thing goes up and kapooey. Everything goes up and kapooey. Um, uh, of course, uh, Jack Torrance doesn't make it out. He does not make it out of the uh, building. He is the one that dies, of course. And, and we kind of find out that he's a little bit at the beginning of Dr. Sleep, because there's a sequel to this, Dr. Sleep. As we find out at the beginning of Dr. Sleep... Um, Jack Torrance is almost thought of as a hero, even though he was not the hero of this book. He was kind of the villain. He was kind of the main antagonist of this book. We find out that in the, the beginning of Dr. Sleep that he's kind of revered as a hero. Like, hey, he tried to save. He was down there working with all them tens of thousands of dials on the on the boiler to try to get things so it didn't explode. But, you know, he just he was like the captain of the ship. He went down with the ship, you know, yay, he, heroic. So it's kind of like in the beginning of Dr. Sleep, we find out that when the news stories of the uh, hotel explosion came out, he's kind of canonized as this hero. Um, and, uh, but I'm going to be, I'm reading, and that's the thing, is uh, that's a good point that I bring up. I am reading Dr. Sleep right now. So our next, I'm not reading it drunk though. I'm, I'm done with the, I've only, I've been drunk once in my life. That is one times too many. Um, although it did help me enjoy this book a lot more. Um, so there is that. There's a silver lining to everything. Um, but uh, the, uh, what was I talking about? Oh, Dr. Sleep. Yeah, that, that will be my next Stephen King discussion is Dr. Sleep. Because I wanted to read The Shining and then Dr. Sleep right after that because they go together. And um, I do remember liking Dr. Sleep quite a bit more than this. So we'll see if I still like Dr. Sleep quite a bit more than this. Now, my estimation of this book has went up some, not quite a bit. It has went up some. I mean, I think if I was to redo my 90 top Stephen King books ranking, this would, rather than finishing in the 70s somewhere, it might finish in the top 50, maybe between 40 and 50 it's still not, it still didn't leap up into my um, top 10 or anything. Um, but I will tell you, being shit-faced on Ardbeg 10, scotch, peated, smoky whiskey, helped. And I think it was apropos for the story that I was reading. 
And it helped me enjoy it. Yes, it did. I'll be honest. Um, not going to do it again, though. Man, not going to do it again. I did not like pooping fire. I did not. I did not. I mean, just me, breathe, after getting drunk on this, just breathing was setting my fire alarms off in the house. Anyway, that's the Shining discussion. Have your comments below, and we'll talk about it.